Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time. We know that you are a God who promises and you'll never fail. Your promises are yes and amen on every believer and every minister of the gospel, especially your own servants that are here tonight. Oh Lord, I am praying the care, the provision you have for every one of them. I pray you'll supply without any interruption, without any limitation, in Jesus' name. That your mighty power, your mighty provision, and your great things that you have promised will be ours in Jesus' name. Lord, we're praying that your name will be magnified. You will be glorified. And your kingdom will be expanded and extended through the hands and the ministries of all these ministers in Jesus' name. As we have claimed, as we have believed, as we have received, you will do great, mighty things in the life, in the ministry, and through the efforts of everyone here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... God bless every one of you who can be seated. Tonight we're looking at the message, the price and the prize of an effective minister's family. You know, we're talking about the family. And we're talking about the minister's family. And we're talking about the price you pay. We're talking about what will cost you. And then the prize you win, the trophy you win, the crown you win, the reward you win, and the harvest you reap as a result of having an effective minister's family. When you think about it, everyone needs a good family. But the minister in particular needs a great family. The minister's family serves as a model in the church, an example in the ministry lifting up the standards for the families or perhaps lowering down the lowering down the standard for the families in the church the minister's family exerts much influence on other families positive or negative exemplary family life will contribute immensely to effectiveness and excellence in ministry where well, you know excellence in anything excellence in any field demands willingness to work hard willingness to pay the price those who pay the price are those who win the prize they're the people that win the crown they're the people that win the trophy they're the people that receive the reward and they reap the benefit of an effective fruitful ministry I'm looking at 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm looking at it from verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desired the office of a bishop, the office of an elder, the office of a preacher, the office of a pastor, the office of a presbyter, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Not just the office, his work, his ministry, his effort, his sowing and reaping, his planting and reaping and harvesting. It is work, but it is a good, good work. A bishop then, an elder then, a presbyter then, a pastor then. A leader, a Christian leader then, and a person chosen of God, a servant of God then, must be blameless. And when you think about blamelessness, at the very first place where you can test it out, where you can examine it, where you can find it out, is in the family. How does this minister treat his wife? How does this Christian woman leader treat husband? How do these Christian parents, leaders, how do they treat their children? Where well, you can find out whether we ministers are blameless or not. You start with the family. The husband of one wife. Having a relationship with one wife. 
intimacy with one wife. Keeping the marriage covenant with one wife. Loving, embracing, and appreciating. Intimately having close relationship with one woman, one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior. On the pulpit, of good behavior. In the church, in the service, of good behavior. On the street, when the drivers drive wrong, you're a minister of good behavior. When things are not working right, not working well, of good behavior. When tr people try to get on your nerves, and they try to step on your toes, and they try to turn things upside down, the minister of God, of good behavior. When some critical tongues are walking against you, and talking against you, and telling lies against you, and they are slandering you, and they are putting you down, and they are cutting you down, of good behavior. When you read things in the papers about your church, about your ministry, and the facts are not correct, and the information is not correct, and they are saying things that are not factual about you, of good behavior. And when it appears they are trying to run down your ministry, and try to scatter your congregation of good behavior, giving to hospitality, apt to teach, skillful in teaching, prepared for teaching, able to teach, effective teaching of the word, not giving to wine, no striker. The minister does not solve his problem like politicians solve their problems. The ministers do not get into exchanging rough words, bitter words, exchanging blows because something went wrong. The minister does not show, does not demonstrate physical ability and energy in being able to crush the enemy so we can fight it out. What we demonstrate is spiritual power. And we don't strike men, we strike the devil. We strike sin. We do not fight flesh and blood. That's not our ministry. We are called on to lift up Jesus and to put down the devil. And it's no striker and it's not greedy or filthy looker. He doesn't minister because of the love of money, but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous. One that rules well, one that guides well, one that manages well, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. A minister of the gospel, he rules his house with the principles of the word of God. He makes God the center of his family. And he's also having his children in subjection to the word of God. In subjection to the doctrines of the Bible. In subjection to the principles of righteousness with all... What's that word? I said, what's this word here? Is it with all frivolity? With all carelessness? With all jesting, and sometimes you cannot you cannot detect that the man is a prophet of God. You cannot detect the man is an ambassador of Christ. You cannot detect the man is representing God when you get to his family so rowdy and it's so noisy. And all the all the pollutions of the world coming through the television tube is poured everywhere in the sitting room, and even they may even have it in the toilet, and of course in the inner chamber. Everywhere you cannot tell that this is a minister's family. But it says if we're families that are devoted to the Lord, and we're families that the head of that family is a man of God is a minister of the gospel. He has his children in subjection with all gravity. Tell me now in verse 5, for if a man knows not how to rule his own house, 
how shall he take care of the church of God? Go down to verse 11. Even so, must their wives be grave. You know, dear sisters here, if you want to adorn your own ministry and adorn the ministry of your husband, your appearance will not be lousy. Your appearance will not be like that of Jezebel. Uh, there will be some subjection. There will be some beauty of holiness. There will be some meekness. There will be some humility. Even in your appearance, because it says, even so must their wives be grave. My dear sisters, you don't have any choice. Once your husband is a minister of the gospel, you cannot say he is the one that received the gospel. He is the one that received the ministry. He is the one that came under the yoke of Christ. Take my yoke upon you. As for me, I didn't receive the call. You are the one that received the call. Take care of your call. No, my dear sister, you cannot do that. Even if you are not a woman leader, even if you are not a preacher, even if you are not a leader among the women, the very fact that you belong to the family and your husband is a minister of the gospel, even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. And then he tells us in verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. And that's the instruction the Lord is giving us as we turn to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are lacking, that are wanting, that are missing there, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Titus, you are to appoint leaders, elders, pastors, preachers over the churches in all that province. Paul, can I just use my initiative? and appoint whoever I want. No, Titus, this is not a private personal business dedicated to Titus and Co. This is God's work. And here is what he takes. If any be blameless. Paul, what if I do not find safe people? Then don't appoint any leader. What if I don't find righteous people, holy people, blameless people? Don't appoint any leader until you find them. What if the blameless people, the sanctified people, the pure people, the righteous people are hard to come by? And we need leaders, and we need pastors, and we need preachers. What if we cannot find the caliber of leaders you describe for me here? Then wait. Don't be in a hurry. When you appoint bad leaders, unrighteous leaders, it is worse than not having any leader at all. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not giving to wine, no striker, not giving to feel the looker, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. As he has been taught. Titus, look at those men before you put them in ministry. You have taught them. You have instructed them. 
They have benefited from the teaching of your ministry. As you benefited from mine, be watching them. If you find any of them that is independent, any of them that is autonomous, any of them that says, that's Titus style. I'm not going to follow Titus style. I am an individual by myself. And I do not want to follow what Paul or Titus has taught me. I want to branch out on my own. I like independence. Leave them alone. Let them be independent and go their independent way and take the independent road unto the place that leads to fruitlessness. But look for the people that are holding fast the faithful word as they have been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gain says you will find then that uh, the people that the Lord calls into ministry and they get involved in the work of the Lord they are the people that their lives are blameless, their lives are righteous, and their families too. Their families are controlled and managed and directed and led according to the principles of the word of God. Uh, what if the lifestyle in the family, maybe the wife, is the one that, you know, if the wife comes to church, and even her attitude, her look, her words, her appearance, drives members of the church away. And they're telling us that, you know, if it were the Osman, if it were this minister alone, uh, this minister is terrific, it's wonderful. But, you know, the wife, the, the wife just drives everybody away. That man becomes a qualified in ministry. What he is just, you know, people say, you know, when you listen to the pastor in the pulpit, the pastor is fantastic, he's terrific. And this man, he goes from one part of the Bible to the other, and this man is great on the, on the pulpit. The only problem is, when you look at the children of this man, it, it discourages, in fact, in fact, I will not want my children to go near the children of the pastor. Because every good thing the pastor has taught in the church or the pulpit, his children will destroy when they interact with my children. I don't want his children to influence my children. That pastor is unqualified for ministry. When you come into the ministry, you understand a great responsibility that is laid upon you in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 27. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27. There came a man of God unto Eli. And said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, and to wear an effort before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father? All the off offerings made by fire of the children of Israel, Eli, wherefore keep ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me. Pastors, how can you honor your sons above God? Above God. God's word. Pastor, your children that you put in the youth choir, leading the youth choir, these children, they don't appear to be born again. Leave them alone. They're my children. I want to keep them there. Because if I don't keep them there, I don't want them to become so wild. So I'm using that, keeping them in the youth choir so I can keep them in the church. The Lord will reject you and your children and your family because that's what he did for Eli. Pastor, your children, they are messing up with the girls in the church. And what are you going to do about it? Are you going to discipline your children? Well, don't scatter my church. Don't scatter my church. Please keep quiet. And whatever my children do, don't look at those children. They are just children. They are just children. And this is the terrible time of their lives. So don't uh, just look away from my children. Look at Jesus. Uh-uh. 
We look at Jesus, but we look at your children too. We look at your wife too. We look at your, at your life too. Very, very important. Wherefore, said the Lord, are you kicking at my sacrifice? And where I indeed said, look at verse 30. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed, that's what I said in the past, that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the is come, that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house that there shall not be an old man in thine house, and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, in all the wells which, my, which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be a, an old man in thine house forever, just because of these children, and the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age, and there shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Ophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. What will then happen to the work of the Lord? And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart. And in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. You understand what the Lord is telling us? He's telling us that the family of the minister, the family of the pastor, the family of the priest matters a lot. And there's a, a price to pay. And then there's a price you are going to win when your family is the effective minister's family. I'm dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the proper perspective. Number two, the purposeful partnership. Number three, paying the price. Number one, the proper perspective of an effective minister's family. The proper perspective of an effective minister's family. Number two, purposeful partnership for edifying ministry and mission fulfillment. Purposeful partnership for edifying ministry and mission fulfillment. Number three, paying the price for excellence and ministerial fruitfulness. Paying the price for excellence and ministerial fruitfulness. I come to number one. The proper perspective of an effective minister's family. When you're thinking about a minister's family, what do you mean by an effective minister's family? What are the qualities you are looking for? What are the marks you are looking for? What are the principles you are looking for? Something practical in the family of the man of God, in the family of the woman of God that will show that this is a minister's family that will actually build up the ministry because the minister's family life can build or break the man. The minister's family life can make or mar his ministry. The fruit of our labor in ministry may be multiplied on the one hand or may be minimized on the other hand by the condition of our family righteousness and effectiveness in ministry can only be built upon the foundation of right relationship and love in the family to have the proper perspective of an effective minister's family we must rediscover god's original purpose and his continual design for the family what does it say in the word of god look at this in genesis chapter 1 Genesis chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, 
after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. What's an effective family for a minister? When the minister is saved and the wife is saved. When the minister has the image of God and the wife has an Im the image of God. When the husband has the likeness of Christ and the wife has the likeness of Christ. When the husband has the character of Christ and the wife has the character of Christ. And both of them united together. They have dominion. They have authority. And there is no guilt. And the love of God is in them. And the image of Christ is stamped deep on the heart of the man and of the heart of the wife and together they are running the race in this Christian life that is a Christian family and the minister will be able to enjoy his ministry with that wife be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. What's an effective minister's family? A family that has dominion. They do not have any problem within the family upon which they do not have dominion. And the minister's wife does not go to members of the church. Come and talk to your pastor, my husband. We have got into our problem again. The man is fighting me again. As you see him preaching in the pulpit, he fights in the house. Come and, come and settle us. A, a, a Christian family, especially a minister's family, they have dominion over all the petty, petty, small, small things that happen in the home. There is dominion. There is authority. There is power. That is how you know an effective minister's family. Not only that, the dominion of faith and the power of faith is in that family that those two members of the body of Christ together, the husband and the wife, any problem in that family, any problem in the church, both of them together, holding hands of love and faith, they have dominion together there. And as a result of their combining their efforts together in ministry, not working against one another, they are working together. They are praying together. They are ministering together. They are living together. And they are having a positive impact and influence upon the church together. They are fruitful. The ministry is fruitful in their hand. In Joshua chapter 24. An effective minister's family. Joshua chapter 24. And I'm reading to you from verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you. To serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served. That were on the other side of the flood. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Here is the statement of a husband. A Christian husband. A minister who is an husband. That is effective in his family. And in the ministry. But as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. An effective minister, if he has a good Christian family, he is able to enforce by love, by gentleness, by, com by compassion, with all the methods the Spirit of God will give him, he is able to enforce the doctrines of the Bible in his family. You children of Israel, whatever you want to do, if it seems wrong to you, evil to you, to serve the Lord, take care of yourself. Whatever you want to do, it's your choice. As for me and my family, my house, we will serve the Lord. And God have mercy on you if you're a minister and you're not able to enforce the doctrines of the Bible in your home, on your daughters, on your sons, on your own wife. 
and there are more spiritual women in the church than your wife. God have mercy on you. That your wife is not in the forefront of demonstrating the doctrine and the teaching of salvation by grace. Your wife is not in the forefront of demonstrating holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And your children, they are not in the forefront of, demonstra of demonstrating the possession of life eternal, justification by faith, and the Christian life. God have mercy on you if you are standing on the pulpit and you are preaching. And then there are better children in the congregation than your children. And there are more spiritual women in the congregation than your wife. God have mercy on you for you to go on your knees in this new year, in this congress, and go and hold the hand of your wife if you are going to cry, if you are going to plead, if you are going to kneel down, if whatever it is you are going to do, if you are going to fast and say, my wife, we must be in the forefront of demonstrating the doctrines of the Bible. That is an effective minister's family. It tells us in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. What an example we have here. In Luke chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. Luke 1 verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the cause of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Can, can you think about this? Look up here. A certain priest. Of what tribe would that be? Well, it would be related to the Levites, with Aaron and the wife of Aaron. I see that those who say they are ministers of God, especially those of you who have, uh, you, you have been single, and then you are ministering in the church. And as you are ministering in the church, you want to marry. And the Lord cannot have mercy on you, cannot have favor on you to get married to somebody spiritual, somebody of the tribe of Aaron, somebody of the tribe of Levi. And you are a minister of the gospel. And you tell us the will of God that you have discovered is one of the lowest, spiritually lower, lowest people in the congregation. And then they come and we, you know, question them. They literally we can question them. And they, they, are, they are modeled up on the doctrine of salvation, on sanctification, on Holy Ghost baptism. And while we're in the church, the person you the, the only person you can see as the will of God for you in the in the whole church, in that large church, while we're praying, see the pastor's wife is sleeping. And the pastor's wife does not know the references of the Bible. And other people will be tapping her sister, wake up. They are still preaching. Other people are looking at you, you are pastor's wife. Shame on us. You see Zechariah here, and you see the wife Elizabeth here, chosen from a good tribe, a spiritual tribe, a tribe that is devoted and dedicated to serving the Lord. And he tells us in verse 6, and they were both righteous before God. That is a family that befits a real man of God. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking in all the commandments. Whether the wife is at home or not at home, the man is walking in all the commandments of the Lord. And when the man travels out and the woman is still at home, the woman is walking in the commandments of the Lord and in the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And he tells us in verse 7, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they were both now well streaking in years. There was no child in that family, but there was no quarreling. There was no fighting. There was no argument. We're talking about an effective minister's family. Is your family like that? Both righteous. And even though there might have been a lack in the family, yet we know that there is righteousness, there is integrity, and there is honesty, and there is no shady deal or shady relationship with, from the man, the pastor, to all the women in the church. 
or from the wife of the pastor to other men in the church. If a woman will not understand the honor, the integrity of being a pastor's wife and will make herself so low as to have any shady, any kind of doubtful relationship that even members of the church, they're saying, uh uh. Why is uh, if they call her mama or they call her mommy or they call her sister? Why is uh, mama in our church, sister in our church? Why is she so close to brother so and so? And whenever he is husband, uh, pastor, whenever uh, our spiritual father is not at home, why is he that, you know, every time, every day, that, uh, you know, pastor's wife is always with this man? What's, what's happening here? Or is this a woman trying to send a signal to us that the man is not performing at home, therefore is uh, getting near, near the men in the church? If we're going to be a family that will still have authority in speaking the word of God, in demonstrating the gospel to other people. The man is righteous, and the woman is righteous, and the children, they are supporting as well. Let me show something beautiful here. In verse 41, in verse 41, it says, and it came to pass, that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe lived in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you see that? That's the wife. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Go to verse 59. And it came to pass that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zechariah after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so. But he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to the father how he will have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed. And he spake and praised God. And then we are told, and fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these things were noise abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And then it says, and all they that had them led them in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied. The mother, Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost. The father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. Thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Even from his mother's womb. Can you think about that? The mother filled with the Holy Ghost. The father filled with the Holy Ghost, and the son filled with the Holy Ghost. An effective minister's family. That the father is saved, the mother is saved, the children are saved. The mother is sanctified, the father is sanctified, and the children are sanctified. And this is a kind of sanctification, holiness that you see in their character. You see in their behavior, you see in their comportment, you see in their zeal, you see in their passion, and you see in their dedication to the things of the Lord, and you see in their faithfulness, faithfulness to God, and faithfulness to one another. And the man, filled with the Holy Ghost, 
has the promptings of the Holy Ghost and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and he has the influence of the Holy Ghost upon his life and if the wife is not there and a woman is relating with him just talking to him even the distance you keep between you and that woman and the things to say between you and that woman the Holy Ghost will say uh uh watch it if your wife were here will you say that thing you are telling that lady now the Holy Ghost will remind you, if your wife were here, will you be this close, this intimate to this woman? And the wife being filled with the Holy Ghost, even when the husband is not there. The Holy Ghost will be reminding her, uh uh, you're looking too free. You're almost becoming frivolous. If your husband were here, will you be as close as this to this man? The Holy Ghost will tell you. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, and the things you are saying, and the things you are revealing, and that your heart you are opening up, and the things you are showing to the man, if your husband were here, will you go this far? And if the children are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will be reminding them, child, you are far away in school. If daddy and mommy were here, will you say what you are saying now? Will you be where you are now? A family, a minister's family that is under the control, under the influence, under the illumination of the Holy Ghost, you'll be sensitive to the things of the Lord. And you'll be sensitive to your covenant with your husband and with your wife. As you look at Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Ye yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is he thy companion, the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, He hated putting away. Whatever your country allows, whatever your country does not allow, God hates divorce. Whatever your denomination allows, whatever your denomination does not allow, God hates divorce. Maybe in some denominations, because we have some people here, they are fellowshipping with us. So we love you. You love us. But we are guided by different, different principles and bylaws. Because the bylaws in some denominations are so strong. Stronger than the doctrines of the Bible. And the bylaws in some denominations permit that even when you have separated from your wife, even when you have divorced and you have married another, that you can still keep on preaching and keep on ministering. But God says, that's your denomination. He hates putting away. That if there is an unresolved problem between you and your wife, you have not even divorced, you have separated. You cannot live together. Because your wife has something against you. And you have something against your wife. You have not even divorced. You have just separated because of that unresolved issue. When you bring your gift to the altar. And there you remember that your wife, your husband has something against you. And that thing has become so serious that though you have not married another, you have separated from that wife, you cannot live under the same roof, leave your gift at the altar. No preaching now, no offering now, and no worship now. Go back home, settle with your wife, bring her back, reconcile together. After you reconcile, come back to the ministry. I don't know what your bylaw says in your church, but that's what the Bible says. And if we're going to have opportunity of leading the people of God in this end time, in these last days, we must come back to the Bible 
and uphold the standard of the word of God on the family. Because the Lord God of Israel saith, he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take it to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Well then, the Lord has shown us in this word the proper perspective of an effective minister's family. To have a proper perspective of an effective Christian family, we have to rediscover God's own original purpose and God's own continual design. Having a positive, supportive relationship will create a happy atmosphere in which each of us, husband, wife, children, will be able to realize the divine purpose and the divine plan in life and ministry. I go to point number two. In point number two, purposeful partnership for a defined ministry and mission fulfillment. Purposeful partnership for a defined ministry and mission fulfillment. Now, as you look at the partnership that we have in the scripture, husband and wife, we're looking at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help, an assistant, an associate, a partner, meet for him, suitable for him. Obviously, when the Lord instituted marriage and a family, he did it so that there will be partnership. And then he tells us in chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in his image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, blessed them together. And God said unto them, unto them together, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. That's the purpose of the Lord. We're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, reading from verse 9. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Look at that verse of scripture and think, look back at him, look back at your family, each of us, my brother, my sister. Remember if you were in the ministry before you were married, how effective were you? How fruitful were you? How dynamic were you? How honest were you? And how did the ministry, the work of God, prosper in your hand? Now, you are married. Are you still as faithful? Are you still as fruitful? Are you still as joyful in the service of the Lord? Are you still as productive in the service of the Lord? Is it better today in ministry than it was before you, came, before you were married? Two are better than one. Let me ask you a question. If somebody is doing a particular work and he has a partner and that partner is just folding the hand and is not involved in the work at all, can we say the two of them are better than one? No, sir. Because the partner is just there, just looking on, not even singing, not even rejoicing, not even giving a helping hand, not even giving an encouraging word. You just stay in a loop. You're still alone. Although the person is there, it might, she might even be a disturbance, a hindrance, because she's just there. And because she's idle and indolent and not doing anything, she's hungry. Are you not going to stop so we can go home? Hurry, hurry up. And two will not be better than one. When will two be better than one? When the two of them are involved, and they are thinking the same way, and they are planning the same thing, and they are going the same direction, and they are involved in the same ministry, husband and wife, a purposeful partnership for an edifying ministry and mission fulfillment. 
two are better than one if they are both involved in that work of the Lord. If they are doing different parts that will complement one another in the work of the Lord. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. I look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm looking at verse 29 and verse 30. 29 and 30. Oh, that they were wise. That they understood this. That they would consider their latter end. Oh, that they were wise. My brother, my sister. Families of ministers. Oh, that we were wise today. That we sit down. And I say, my wife, how many years have we been together now in marriage? Eight years. Eight years. Think about it. Are we going to continue like this? Oh, that we were wise and will consider our latter end. If we spend the next eight years, if Jesus tarries, the way we spent the last eight years, are we going to be fruitful together in the ministry? Oh, that we were wise, that we call our children together. How old are your children now? Your children, maybe they are now at the university. All these years, children, come, let's sit down together. I see that when I rush to the church, and I'm there because I must be there at the beginning of the service, I see that you don't come until one hour, two hours later. And they have already, we are almost getting into the message area of the worship before you come. My children, if we continue like this for the next 10 years, what will be our latter end? And all that you ministers were wise. And you'll consider your wife. And consider your husband. And consider your children. Oh, that you are wise and you will evaluate the impact of your family. And you will evaluate what it is you have achieved. And say, if we are going to have the reward of a family serving the Lord, the man, the wife, and the children, when the Lord will come, then things have to change so that it will not be the way we spent the past years, we're going to spend the coming years. That we will understand. Is our love enough to make us productive in ministry? The power of the Lord that we have together is each according to the scripture. Is each enough? Or is there something we need to change? Is there something we need to adjust? Is, it, is there something we need to put in place so that our family will be as a family of a minister of God, of a man of God, of a woman of God, or to be? How in Bostachi should one chase a thousand and to put ten thousand to flight? Do you see the multiplied effect of partnership in real ministry of the minister? That one will chase a thousand and then when these two come together in love in affection in faith in, in power and in the direction of life then the two of them instead of one thousand plus one thousand making two thousand will put ten thousand to flight in matthew chapter 18. matthew chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 18. Here the Lord is still telling us about the partnership we have together and the purpose and the effect and the fruit and the result and the reward of that partnership. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let me ask you, as you see these promises of God, are you wishing, are you wondering in your mind and saying, you know, when I come to church, my faith is lifted up. And as I go back to my family, I, I'm almost sure, I'm almost sure, my wife is going to do something, my wife is going to say something, 
my wife is going to act somehow that the courage I had, the conviction I had, the decision I had, and the upliftment I had when I was in the conference in the Congress, I'm so sure when I get back home, I'm sure of what that woman is going to do. She is going to bring me down again to the first level to score one. What kind of marriage is that? But a wife that will be a wife of faith, a wife of love. A wife that gives encouragement. A wife that as the husband is moving up, she's supporting, she's encouraging, she's uplifting. And she says, yes, my husband, that's what we're going to do. You're not even going to climb alone. We're going to climb that ladder of ministerial success and victory together. What a family. That is the purpose of the partnership. To edify one another and to multiply the effect of ministry. And then it says in verse 19 again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask. Do you pray together, husband and wife, on the problems of the church? On the needs in the church? On the difficulties in the church? Or do you just gossip together? Or do you just slander members of the church together? Or do you just pick holes in the messages that are preached in the church? Or do you just belittle and downgrade the other ministers in the church, husband and wife in the church? Are you agreeing together? I challenge you. You belong to a local church. And you are one of the ministers. And you have discovered there's a problem in this area of the church. There's a problem in this area of the church. There's a problem in that area of the church. Husband and wife, do you understand? Do you make use of the purpose of your partnership in marriage as a minister? And then you take that problem in the church. You take it to the Lord in prayer. That if two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. That's the reason why you are united together. That's the reason why you are striving together for the purpose and the goal of the ministry. Partnership then in the family is for the purpose of fulfilling the divine plan. Partnership, husband and wife in the ministry. It is for the purpose of fulfilling the divine plan. Let me break it down for you. Number one is for fruitfulness in the marriage and in the ministry. Fruitfulness in the marriage and in the ministry. Can I ask you a question? The way you are concerned about fruitfulness in your family, husband and wife, minister, you are married and there is no child yet, and you fast and you pray and you do everything you want to do so that you can have children in the family. Are you concerned like that when there are no converts? Are you concerned like that when there's no growth in the church? Are you concerned like that when there are no spiritual children in the church? That's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that the purpose and the reason why you came together as husband and wife in the ministry is so that there will be fruitfulness in the marriage, there will be fruitfulness in the family as well, in the ministry as well. Number two, that there will be dominion and authority in personal and ministerial territory. That's in your life. I've read it to you in Genesis chapter 1. That's in your family life and in your ministerial life. Husband and wife, you are together. You should be able to get so concerned about the ministry that your partnership together as husband and wife in the ministry will give you dominion and authority in personal and ministerial territory. Number three. It should give you added and multiplied ability in the challenges of life and in the challenges of the ministry. That one will chase a thousand and two will put ten thousand to flight. In all honesty, can we say that we have seen something like that? Do we husbands and wives, do we even ever create time to pray together? If uh, a preacher wants to embarrass other ministers, it will be like now to just say, be faithful and be honest and be truthful in the sight of the Lord. How often do you, husband and wife, here, ministers, overseers, leaders, how often do you and your wife pray together 
on the church, on the ministry, on the assignment, the divine assignment and privilege the Lord has given you. Many of us might be embarrassed, might be embarrassed for us to have time together. And that's the challenge the Lord is giving us. He's telling us that we have come together for partnership. And in that partnership, when we partner together, and we fellowship together, and we pray together, not just on the little, little things of life, on the details of the ministry, there is added ability. There is multiplied ability in dealing with the challenges of life and challenges of the ministry. Number three, increase power and victory in prayer with greater faith. Increased power and increased victory in prayer with greater faith. Number five, mutual encouragement to turn failure to success. Mutual encouragement to turn failure to success. A wonderful day it will be when the horseman will cut off every, every negative language and will cut off the negative tongue. And they will speak with new language so that the ministry of the wife, whatever the wife is doing in the kingdom of God, for the progress of the work of the Lord, the husband will always have a word of encouragement, a word of upliftment. And the wife also, wonderful day it will be when the wife will have no negative word, but everything positive, encouraging, every time. Mutual encouragement to turn failure to success. Number six. Positive assistance and positive association for promised accomplishment. Positive assistance and association for promised accomplishment. That we come together, husband and wife, and our partnership together in the family and in the ministry is bringing the promised accomplishment. Number seven, united hearts for spiritual stress. To maintain an uncompromising stand till the end. Not pulling in different directions. If that's the way my wife wants to go, she wants to be so serious on this holiness that we're preaching. Ah, am I not the preacher in the church myself? Why is she taking it like this? And, you know, please, come, my dear sister, don't drive away the women in the church for me. All this talk about this and this and this and holiness and uh, don't, don't have any other meeting with those women anymore in the church. Uh, the one who are preaching on Sunday, the one I'm giving them is enough. So all those uh, things, all those little, little details, you are still calling them apart and telling them holiness, holiness, holiness. Don't drive them away from me. That's enough. That's enough. What kind of marriage is that? That the husband cannot give the wife a free hand to uphold the standard and to help the women folk in the church to live the life they ought to live. Or it is the wife that will be saying, ah, uh -uh, my husband, oh, what kind of message was that you were preaching last Sunday? And the way you were talking, don't use this and don't use that. Live like this and live like this and stand straight and stand up and be uncompromising and love the Lord. Are, are you saying, are you preaching by implication that I am not all right? Tell me directly in the house. Why are you, why are you preaching indirectly on the pulpit? My dear sister, leave that man alone when he preaches. Don't, uh, you know, tear the message apart. If there is anything that touches you there, go on your knees and take it to the Lord in prayer and let the blood of Jesus walk wash and cleanse you and purge and purify you, you will be the better for it and the whole church will be the better for it. We are to unite our hearts for spiritual strength and we are to maintain together husband and wife with the children and uncompromising stand until the end and we will do it like that in Jesus name. All this demands spending time together to pray and to carefully plan in God's presence to spiritually create our future and the future of the ministry together. Time together, number one, strengthens love. Number two, renews life. Number three, reveals possibilities. Number four, restores fresh, restores fellowship. Number five, refreshes relationship. Number six, increases trust and confidence. Number seven, edifies the family. Number, six, number eight, builds the ministry. That's the reason husband and wife will need to spend more time together. More time together reading the Bible. More time together reading some good 
good inspiring books more time together listening to good instructive cases together more time together praying together and then it will do this for you it will strengthen your love your love for god and your love for the things of God, and your love for one another, it will renew and revitalize your life. It will reveal different, greater possibilities for every, for both of you, and for the whole family, and for the children, and for the church at large. It will restore fellowship. It will refresh your relationship together. It will even increase your trust and confidence in God and in one another. It will edify the family, and it will build the ministry the Lord has placed in your hand. I come to point number three. Pay the price for excellence and ministerial fruitfulness. Brothers and sisters, we pay the price. We pay the price. You know, a message like this is not a message of motivation. There's encouragement, there's instruction, and there is whatever it is we find that we need to have. We need to take hold of so that we will understand the purpose of God for our family and the purpose of God for our partnership together and the purpose of God for our fellowship together. Paying the price for excellence and for ministerial fruitfulness in Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading to you from verse 29. Many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all. That should be the goal of the wife, the Christian wife. That should be the goal of the minister's wife. That many daughters in the church, they're doing well. And they have done virtuously. But this because is the partner, the spouse, the wife of the minister in that church excellest them all. If she is not number one in righteousness and purity, what to be number one? If she is not number one in faith and vision, what to be number one among the women in that church? If she is not number one in supporting the husband and in upholding the doctrine of the Bible that the husband is preaching, which woman is supposed to be number one in upholding the truths of the word of God in that church? Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Come to verse 11. In verse 11, he's talking about this woman, the heart of her husband. Does trust, does simply trust in her so that she shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She, se she seeketh wool and flax and uh, walketh willingly with her hands. Willingly. The husband does not have to be pushing her and pushing her. The price you pay, my dear sister, the wife of the minister in that local church, is that you get yourself to the point where you are never tired and you are willing to get involved in the work of the Lord. And you are working willingly with your very hand. She is like the merchant sheath. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth me to her household and a portion to her maidens. It means that you're having good quiet time and good instructive time with the children. And you're helping the children. You're looking at the assignment. It's a price to pay. And you're looking as the children are becoming teenagers and they're developing those daughters. You're teaching them how to keep themselves. You're teaching them about what they ought to know, which the church cannot teach them in the public, and which they cannot teach them right in the schools. You're giving them instruction. And you're giving instruction to the boys as well. As they're growing up, your bo the bodies, your, the changes in your body. Here is what will take place, and the attractions you will have, and how to manage all that, so that you'll not get into trouble, and so that you'll not lose or miss your steps in the Christian life. And then it says she considereth a field and buys it, and with the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. She gathers her loins with strength and strengtheneth her hands. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She is thoughtful. She has foresight. 
and the things in the house and the things in the ministry they're taking care of it's not a, you know there'll be no carelessness that there is a lot of wastage and then he tells us she lays her hand to the spindle and her hand hold the disturb she stretches out her hand to the poor hospitable and generous and yea she re she reacheth forth her hands to the needy she's in the community the ministries in the church and she's always thinking about these underprivileged and the poor people and the naked people and the unfortunate people and the illiterate uneducated people and the sick people and the widows and the strangers and the people around that he needs to minister to and she's developing ministries ministries in the church ministries that will reach out she is mobilizing the other women and she is uh, motivating the other women and she is molding and she is mentoring the other women and they are reaching out and reaching other people in the community and as she is stretching out her hand to the poor she is reaching forth her hands to the needy as well in verse 21 she is not afraid of the snow for her household for all her household are clothed with scarlet she maketh herself coverings of tapestry and her clothing is silk and purple she doesn't appear shabby either no worldliness but she's neat and she's presentable and she matches the ministry of righteousness and holiness there's no carelessness about any detail of her life her husband is known in the gaze when he is when he's seated among the elders of the land she maketh fine linen and selleth it she's enterprising and delivereth girdles unto the merchant strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in the time to come she openeth a mouth with wisdom and then we're told in her tongue is the law of kindness even when it appears that you know we ministers and we men there are times that men just have to be forthright and bold and aggressive you understand we're soldiers of the cross and the nature of the man is different from that of the woman. And even when the man, when the, when the husband maybe has disciplined somebody and has said, no, you cannot do that. Here is how to stand. Here is where to stay. That's the man. That's the minister. The wife is coming with gentleness and meekness behind and is comforting those people and is encouraging those people. Oh, the pastor loves you. I, I know how the pastor feels for you at home. We discuss together and we pray about members of the church at home. Even though she is bold on the pulpit, he's trying to help you. Don't get discouraged. We're praying for you. What is the need of the family? Let's see you in church next Sunday. Don't get discouraged just for a short time it will soon be over the law of kindness is in her mouth and she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness her children arise up and call her blessed her husband also and he praises her many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all that's the price it will take and when we pay that price then the lord will give us the reward in our family i said he'll give us the reward in our family yeah. now paying the price it's not just the woman that pays the price even the man too we pay the price as well in ephesians chapter 5 i'm looking at verse 25 ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for each we have a price to pay we have to love our wives and then we need to start today that by the grace of god the way christ loved the church sacrificial love simple love and sincere love and a kind of love that will give up anything for the good of the wife we're going to do it now what the lord is calling us to my brother my sister here tonight before we pray is put first things first in a family relationship my brother after your devotion to god and your faith in christ and your devotion to the work of the lord your wife is next my dear sister after your commitment of faith to the lord after your commitment of your life to the lord your husband is next put first things first in the family relationship the things which matter most must never be at the expense at the mercy of the things that matter least 
do not exalt non-essentials, the essential thing, your family relationship. Keep to that family relationship. Do not allow the things that matter most to be at the mercy of the things that matter least. Let us be willing to pray together. Let us be willing to plan together. Let us be willing to pay the price together. Love one another, forgive one another. Leave the outsiders and cleave together. Protect for one another. And uh, protect one another. Provide for one another. Train the children. Support the family. Worship the Lord together. And serve the Lord unres unreservedly. And the prize, the reward, the trophy, and the reaping, God will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. As we're going to pray, you'll think about your family. Are there things the Lord has revealed to you? I need to become better in this area. I need to become closer to my wife in this area. I need to walk more closely to my wife in this area. I need to encourage my husband more in this area. I need to be more faithful to my wife and to my husband in this area. I need the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. I need more understanding in the family so that myself and my husband, myself and my wife will carry forward the work of the Lord and the work of God will prosper in our hand in Jesus name why don't you rise up and make it happen it will happen it will happen that the Lord himself the Lord himself he will do great things in our life you must pray now you must pray now this must not be the time you will keep quiet you will pray and talk to the Lord oh Lord here we are we bring our families before you we bring our families before you fulfillment to the family accomplishment in the family ministerial success in the family love in the family christ like love sacrificial love in the family that the lord himself the lord himself will achieve what he wants to achieve in the ministry through our family